Hello again and welcome back once again to episode 20 of Signals to Danger. We finally got to 20. It seems like it has absolutely flown by, but thank you so much for coming on this journey with me. As ever, I'm going to open this episode by thanking you for your downloads, shares, likes and for your interaction on social media. If you want to join those conversations, you'll find the podcast at at Signals to Danger and me at at Daniel Fox Rail. Don't forget that you can find show notes, the shop and more at signaltodanger.com as well as being able to find out how to support the podcast if you want to. There's a link there for our Patreon and I'd also love to take the opportunity here to thank Chris, Tom, Lloyd and Abby for signing up to Patreon. And also thank you to you Stephen for your kind donation supporting the podcast. Nice quick intro out of the way today. It's time for us now to get straight into this week's episode. The air was full of the noise of steam engines, those on the small locomotives moving carriages and equipment around, but they were joined by those on the breakdown cranes. Whistles, creaking metal and the clamour of shouted orders and cries for help joined and layered atop, reaching a cacophony far louder than the passing of the express trains which usually filled the air here. The year is 1951 and the place is Doncaster. Investigators at the scene search through the wreckage for the injured. At least 13 people are known to have died. Carriages are crushed one on top of another. One lies metres away and appears partially burned. The railway industry is tonight coming to terms with yet another disaster. This is Signals to Danger, a podcast where we look at major rail disasters which have occurred in the UK, explain what happened, how the investigation was carried out, and how each of these accidents shaped the industry going forwards. I'm Dan. I work within the rail industry in my day-to-day life, but today I'll be the one taking you through this podcast. Every time we do one of these, we start each episode by briefly revisiting the events that were taking place at the time, and, well, this episode is no different. So it's time for us to have a look at 1951. On January the 1st, a universally recognised theme tune first took to the airwaves, recognised so strongly that those of us who've never even listened to the show would probably recognise the song. I would whistle it, but there's probably some sort of copyright issue there. But it was The Archers, and the drama had begun. March brought us Dennis the Menace, the superstar of the Beano comic, to this day. And as a child growing up, admittedly not in 1951, but I was torn between him and Desperate Dan of the Dandy. The year also sees the establishment of national parks in the UK. April saw the Peak District be inaugurated as the first one. In May, it was joined by the Lake District and November saw Dartmoor and Snowdonia join the crew. On the 3rd of May, the Festival of Britain was opened, a whole display showcasing the achievements of a proud nation. October brought us Churchill, beginning his second block of time serving as the Prime Minister after six years of Labour leadership. And also the first zebra crossing appeared on our roads for the first time. The positives of this month were however somewhat overshadowed by an increasing breakdown in British and Egyptian relationships, all of which would eventually culminate in the Suez Canal crisis several years later. All of this was actually very exciting and the year was mostly positive, especially considering some of these intros and the highlights I pick out, although highlights is a term I'd sometimes use quite loosely. Unfortunately we can't remain in a positive mindset because our story takes us to the 16th of March. Once more, this episode brings us to the East Coast main line, and with six appearances on the record so far, that means over a quarter of our episodes have taken place here. 
You could be forgiven for thinking that this might make the ECML a dangerous piece of railway real estate, but allow me to reassure you that it just isn't. It is, well, it just so happens that if you wanted to pick any line, you'd probably find an equally bloody history. And it just so happens that these are the episodes I've covered so far. The line which stretches from Waverley in Edinburgh down to London's King's Cross is one of the major arterial routes up and down the country and carries both long distance passengers and local commuters as it currently stands. And in the past, the uh, scene wasn't too different, but admittedly, a little more smoky. This line is a crucial link up and down the nation, and because of this, the towns and cities grew and grew in close proximity. Newcastle, York, Peterborough, all of them gained mainline large stations, sprawling goods yards and miles of sidings. Among them was another railway town, Doncaster. Nowadays, Doncaster, or Donny, if you will, because it seems like we don't like saying full names here in Yorkshire, is a firm favourite with the rail enthusiast. With several platforms, bays and through roads, there's quite the choice of place to stand and watch trains pass by, and there's no shortage of traction either, with high-speed passenger stock almost as frequent as commuter and freight services. One of the main draws, however, stands between the main up and down platforms. Two through roads without platforms. A great opportunity to watch trains fly by at line speed without being too far away from a coffee shop. In 1951, Doncaster was as much of a hive of activity as it is now, trains arriving and leaving all of the time, as well as those speeding through. Today's story is that of a train which departed Doncaster on the 16th of March, but the story actually begins with two trains which arrived here. Last episode I talked about one of the benefits of coaches and locomotives when compared to the multiple units of the present. Trains could be made up of exactly the types and numbers of carriages required, but additionally to that, trains could be joined and split at different locations across the route. This is one aspect of operation which the multiple units can actually replicate now. It's Well, while it's great to run trains to every place, from every place, it doesn't really translate to the most efficient way of working. Let's have a theoretical example. Say you wanted to run a train from Middlesbrough all the way through to London, and another one all the way from Scarborough to London. You could run these two completely separate trains, both from the northeast coast, but it does mean that two sets of train crew need to work all the way down the country. It's a duplication of hours, and that could be frustrating. But I suppose if there's more trains to run, then operators can always hire in and pay more crew. It's, it's manageable. There is, however, a bigger constraint, which forms much more of a hard limit. Paths. The very short version, and I promise I am about to circle back to today's story, is this. Because of the distance between signals, there are a limited number of trains that can run on any given section of the network. Suppose there's a theoretical maximum of one train per each signal section, although this would mean that every single train would be constantly approaching a red signal and crawling along, never really getting up to any speed. In an ideal world, you'd probably always be about four sections apart and running on green, but the more congested the railway is, the less feasible this is. Hence the concept of paths. For each section of line, there is a limited number of paths, which are more or less slots for trains to pass through. This controls the congestion in the area and allows the reduced number of trains to move more quickly. Very simple and pretty effective, but mm, could scupper your plans to run trains from everywhere to everywhere. But there is a really simple way around this, and we do see it relatively frequently nowadays. Going back to our example, our two theoretical trains to London. There aren't enough paths for both trains to travel on the busy congested lines towards London, so a different method of work is used. Two trains would start their own journeys, one in Middlesbrough and one in Scarborough. They would both run in their own paths from their origin up until the point where their routes converged. Let's call it York. At this point, the two units could be coupled together and run forward as one train. One train, one path. 
and one set of train crew, which is an added bonus. And in all honesty, this is not a modern concept, and that's the point we eventually circle back round to today's tale. This has been going on for almost as long as the railway has, and it was easy enough to do when trains were composed of separate carriages. These could be shunted, added, subtracted at major stations on the route, and they were routinely. It wouldn't be ridiculous for a normal train from one place to another to have a station call at a mainline station of about 20 minutes. Enough time to drop a couple of carriages off the back and add a parcel van or a horse box or something of that ilk onto the rear. At 8.45 in the morning on the 16th of March, a train left Hull on Yorkshire's east coast and after a relatively short journey, arrived at Doncaster. Six vehicles of this train were now due to form part of another train, the 1006 train from Doncaster to London King's Cross. These six carriages, a third class with a brake compartment, three corridor third class coaches and two composite carriages with a mixture of accommodation, would provide plenty of seats, but not enough for an express to the capital, so shortly after the arrival of the train from Hull, a further nine vehicles arrived on the 915 from York. Coupled up to the rear of the first six vehicles were a further fourth third class coaches, a third class restaurant car, a first class restaurant and a carriage, and a further third class carriage. The rear of the train was brought up with a horse box, and at the lead end an appropriate engine was added to draw the express southbound. 60501 Cock of the North was 101 tonnes of metal, capable of drawing the weight of the 15 vehicles behind it at line speed, and had a competent, experienced driver at the controls. Driver Wadsworth had had much experience of driving expresses along the East Coast Main Line and was stationed out of Doncaster Shed. At 7 minutes past 10, one minute late, Cock of the North drew out of the platform at Doncaster and began the 170 mile journey southbound. Neither Wadsworth nor the 250 passengers on board knew that the journey would come to a sudden end, less than 900 metres and around a minute later. The 1006 Express to King's Cross departed from Platform 4 at Doncaster. This was one of the main platforms used for the Up Express trains headed south to London. It's not the main line though. Do you remember when I was talking about one of the draws for train spotters at the station? It's those two through roads. Those are the up main line and the down main line. The line through Platform 4 is the, the up slow line and Expresses leaving the station needed to cross over from the slow line to the main to make the best time southbound. There are two methods of doing this. The first is a departure from the platform directly to the main via a crossover immediately following the platform. The second involves the train remaining on the slow line for about 500 metres and then traversing another crossover onto the main. It was this second route that Wadsworth was routed via. He gradually increased his speed and approached the crossover to the main. Cock of the North crossed over to the comfortably, as did the first two carriages of the train. It was, however, at this point that things started to go awry. Either the trailing bogey of the third coach or the leading bogey of the fourth derailed to the left as it traversed the crossover. As the train continued onwards, the wheels of the next six carriages followed suit, also derailing to the left. At such a slow speed, this could easily have been a minor occurrence, had it not been for the presence of another piece of track work. 22 yards further along, there was a long crossover. This ran from the down slow, across all of the lines diagonally, and to the goods lines on the other side. As you were driving along, this crossover ran from the right to the left, and played a crucial part in this incident. As the rear of the third coach met this crossover, its derailed wheels were diverted to the left, along with the leading bogey of the fourth. And this created quite a unique situation, 
Cock of the North, at the lead of the train, continued to pull the train forwards, and the first two carriages in the front of the third followed it up on the down, up on the up main. The trailing end of the third continued to rotate to the left, increasingly broadside, and it must have been clear to those travelling within that something was very wrong, even at this low speed. We all know that we're not supposed to travel sideways on a train. The carriage continued to move in this way due to two forces acting independently on it. The leading end, pulled southbound by the loco, and the trailing end, propelled by the weight of the 13 carriages behind it. For a second time in this accident, the placement of a feature significantly worsened the outcome. Around a hundred yards beyond the start of the derailment, you can find Balby Bridge. South of the station, this structure carried the junctions of five roads, including one of the main routes into the central city. To hold up such a substantial structure, the bridge is supported by heavy brick abutments, and the placement of one of these is the reason this accident is the subject of an episode. As the third coach continued to run increasingly perpendicular to the tracks, the leading end was on the up main, and the rear on the up slow. Separating these tracks was one of those heavy bridge abutments. And when the carriage met it, the unthinkable happened. Those two forces acted on it with disastrous consequences. Cock of the North pulled the lead end around the bridge, and the force of the twelve carriages behind it pushed the trailing end around the opposite side. The body of the coach was crushed against the bridge and all but destroyed, and the underframe bent around the stone as if made of something far less substantial than the steel it was actually constructed from. The leading end of the fourth carriage was thrust into the opposite side of the channel through the bridge, causing further damage to both and locking the third firmly in place. This is the first indication that Wadsworth and his firemen had that something was out of the place, as the coupling between the second and third carriages suddenly sheared. There was no way that the third carriage could be dragged back around, pinned in as it was by the fourth, and with a force of around 100 tonnes, the steel pin snapped. When the coupling split, the air hoses connecting the braking system separated and the train came to a stand 75 yards further on. The loco and the first two carriages undamaged. The rear of the 6th and the front of the 7th vehicles were carried over to the left until they came to rest nearly at right angles to the track, with the 6th coach tilted to the left and the 7th overturned on its side. The panelling of both vehicles was damaged and their underframes were twisted, but this was nothing compared to the damage on the 3rd and 4th vehicles. The next two vehicles and the leading bogey of the 10th were derailed without much damage and the remainder of the train just stayed on the line. A low speed derailment, one minute outside of a mainline station and only involving one train. This should not really have been overly concerning and should probably have been an inconvenience, but instead it was a disaster. Every ambulance in Doncaster was summoned, and firemen, doctors and people from nearby houses worked feverishly to aid the injured and search for the victims. And they did find victims. Eighteen of the train's passengers were transported to hospital, and all but six were detained there due to the severity of their injuries. The sheer level of destruction caused to the third coach, however, almost guaranteed that injuries were not going to be the worst of this disaster. Fourteen occupants of this coach were entered into the records as the lives lost. 14 people who would not make it to work or return home to loved ones. Three of this number felt a whole other level of sadness, as the list included a loving husband, his devoted wife, and their 12-month-old child. <laughs> 
Once the passengers had been evacuated and the injured rescued, the process of recovery began. The accident had blocked all but two of the lines south of Doncaster and those were needed for the recovery work. The East Coast Main Line had been shut down. Breakdown cranes from Doncaster, Peterborough and York were called to the scene to aid with recovery. The main lines were successfully released back to traffic by 11.15 in the evening, so around 13 hours worth of downtime logged, but those good lines were out for another few days. The railway inspectorate was on the scene as soon as possible, and at the head of the team were Lieutenant Colonel G.R.S. Wilson and Brigadier C.A. Langley. These are names we've come across before, and it's safe to say the professionals were well and truly on the case. Their task was quite clear. They needed to understand the reason the journey lasting around a minute had resulted in the tragic deaths of 14 people and the destruction of a carriage beyond all recognition. And they would do this through answering several key questions. Most importantly, what was the initial cause of the derailment? What had led to the wheels leaving the track? And once that was ascertained, had there been any contributing factors? Speed? Poor design? Anything like that? The investigation had begun, and their work was cut out for them. We've had a few derailment episodes recently, so I'm not going to bore you by going straight back to my regular derailment mantra. I'll give you a week off. And in all honesty, with such a short journey travelled, it was not a particularly tasking experience to isolate the point where the physical derailment took place. The track was examined about four hours after the derailment, when some of the coaches had been re-railed and moved clear of the crossover. What they found was a close group of diagonal marks around 7 feet long running across the head of the left-hand rail from the inside to the outside beginning at the trailing end of the check rail in the crossover between the up slow and down and up fast. These marks could only have been made by a number of wheel flanges passing over the top of the rail and there were corresponding flange marks on the chairs and sleepers beyond. This type of scarring is sometimes referred to as witness marks and they can tell the story of what took place. They clearly identified that the derailment took place at the crossover. And it's true that we probably could have arrived at this conclusion without a great deal of guesswork. We've seen time and time again, even just on this podcast, that switches and crossings can be a place where there's an inherent weakness in the system. It's not to say that they're dangerous. It's just that moving parts and gaps in rails have risks that a solid piece of metal doesn't. We saw this in the episodes at Potter's Bar, Greyrig, Ealing and even Connington, just to name a few. So it isn't surprising that investigators looked at the crossing that the express was traversing at the time the derailment took place. In the throat of the crossover itself, bolts were found broken and missing which were integral to keeping the tracks engaged to each other the correct distance apart, and distance blocks, pieces of metal which should have helped that process, they were found to be displaced as well. Beyond the throat there were marks of severe rubbing on the inside vertical face of the railhead, and it appeared that those and other marks that a number of wheels had dropped between the two wing rails at or about the throat of the crossing. It was clear that the train had derailed as part of the process of crossing over from the upslow to the fast. There you go, part one answered. But we won't leave it there, because now the team needed to understand the underlying reasons. And of course, this might not be quite as simple to answer. Of course, it wouldn't do for us simply to make that statement and move on. It would also massively shorten the episode, and I'm sure you're not quite done with me yet. To start unpicking the reasons the derailment might have taken place at the crossover, we can start by looking at the crossover itself. Was there physically anything in the design of the layout which might have contributed to the disaster? And there was, in fact, something unconventional in the design of the crossover. 
I said earlier that there were two methods by which a train could leave Platform 4 and head south to the up main. This wasn't always the case however, up until 1910, 40 years before the accident, every train took that crossover immediately following the platform. In 1910 however, a siding was converted into a running line, which brought the up slow into play. This added the additional flexibility to the operation of the station, it meant that a train could be allowed to depart platform 4 and free it up for another arrival, if there was a train approaching on the main. A train had somewhere to go, on the way to the main line, that didn't immediately block it. However, there were quite another, quite a lot of other bits of track and junctions and pieces of infrastructure that really limited where that crossover from the slow line to the main line could be placed. The location had to be at a point where lines were on a curve on the approach to Balby Bridge. This in itself isn't a problem, but because the main lines were used for non-stop expresses, the line had another characteristic that we've discussed before, super-elevation, or cant. To aid the trains that were rocketing through the corner at 60 mile an hour, there was an inclination added to the line. The outside rail was inclined four inches higher than that on the inside, banking the trains into the corner. Unfortunately, this could not be replicated on the down slow, as trains travelling on the slower line might be unbalanced by such a steep angle. So because of this, the tracks on the crossover needed to move from being virtually level to a steep angle of cant in what was relatively a short space, about 40 feet, to have one side of the track tipped up by about 4 inches. For a train travelling at a good clip, this could probably be quite an unsettling set of forces, a swift rock to one side, which I think we can all agree is probably best avoided. So how could such a layout exist? Surely it was dangerous. Well, with a risk control in place, of course, you've listened before, you know we do this. A speed limit was imposed on the down slow, from platform 4 all the way to the point where the line joined the up main. 10 miles an hour. This heavily reduced speed should have mitigated the risk of this cant gradient, or at least severely minimised it. What would have been a swift rock to one side at a high speed was now a gentle angling of the locomotive. So surely our next question would be, had the 1006 been travelling at this speed limit when the train passed over the track? Wadsworth was asked about his speed, of course he was. We're ahead of the era of widespread on-train data recorders, so we have to rely on other methods. Personal accounts are a big part of that. Wadsworth reckoned that he'd been travelling at around 15 miles an hour at the point he took Cock of the North between the slow and main lines. But he also told investigators that he might have travelled over it at 20 to 25 miles an hour previously. He, he knew that the limit was 10. And while that might sound horrifically damning instantly... There are two additional factors that we need to take into consideration. Firstly, driving a steam locomotive is not always an exact science. While I have no doubt in the ability of any driver, the controls are far more complex than the small handles and levers of the present trains, all within an arm's reach and all instantly reactive to inputs. So it means that in real world, in real life terms, there might not always be so much precision. But this does pale in significance to the second factor. Cock of the North, this highly developed mainline steam locomotive, did not have a speedometer. In fact, most locomotives at this time didn't have them at all. Most drivers obeyed limits to a learned judgment, surprisingly accurate in all fairness, but obviously open to misunderstanding. So yes, Wadsworth believed he'd been travelling at 15 miles an hour but even the investigators acknowledged that these lower speeds might be difficult to estimate from the footplate of a large express locomotive. It was necessary to gain a more empirical grasp of the speed that the train had been travelling on the day of the accident, so a series of test runs were undertaken. Cock of the North was brought back to Doncaster, lashed up to a train composed as closely as possible to the accident train, Three runs were made, and on each occasion, the train started from number four platform and was driven in a slightly different way, 
Now, instead of travelling along the up slow line, the train was turned onto the up main at the platform crossover. So, in the uh, in the course of carrying out these experiments, there wasn't an accidental second derailment. The trials were witnessed by two signalmen: signalman Cutforth in Doncaster South box and signalman Cooper in the Bridge Junction box. Both of these gentlemen had been on duty at the time of the accident. The first run resulted in a theoretical speed of 17 miles an hour over the crossover, the second 23 and the third 25. So the signallers were asked. They'd witnessed all three test runs and they'd witnessed the train on the day, which to them seemed more accurate. The thoughts of those signallers, well, the first run, the one that ended up travelling over the crossover at 17 miles an hour, Seems to be a fairly poor show and not really that good compared to the performance of the day. Those second and third runs were selected respectively by the two men. 23 and 25 miles an hour. Not quite that 10 mile an hour limit. So now we ask ourselves, was this our smoking gun? And you could be forgiven for thinking so. However, when the points were inspected, other issues were found with them not directly related to the derailments, which raised larger questions to the maintenance of the crossover itself. The sleepers were found to pump as trains passed over it, which means they dipped as the weight of the train pushed down on them. This isn't meant to happen, and it's indicative of either voids or wet beds forming in the ballast beneath the track. Neither of these is a good thing, and realistically there's something that should be rectified as soon as possible. In a similar vein, one of the packing pieces from under a rail chair was missing. Again, something that needed to be resolved. This track was inspected daily, but on the morning in question this had not yet taken place. But on the previous day when it had been inspected, none of the damaged or missing bolts were accounted for. And after every factor was considered, it was decided that one could be handed the main blame for the derailments. Although there was no clear proof how the damage to the crossing at Doncaster had been initiated, the throat bolt and the air chair bolt were weakened by fatigue flaws to such an extent that they might have broken under traffic at any time. The crossing had not been inspected on the morning of the accident, and it seems at least possible that a key might have been loose or might have fallen out under the vibration of traffic, and this is by no means unknown. During inspections after the accident, the investigators witnessed how easily it could actually happen. If one of the keys had been out, and the bolts broken by the passage of the engine, or another one passing on the main or slow line just before, the lateral support of the other rails would have been seriously weakened, and that was a dangerous state of play indeed. Other bolts had been found during the examination that were in such a poor condition that they too could have broken the traffic at any time. And the track here, though it appeared to have survived the accident relatively well, clearly showed some significant signs of poor repair. The investigators noted that the checking faces of both wing rails had been worn back considerably, and this meant that if an axle had run as far left as this way would allow, the support of the right hand wheel would be barely continuous, crossing from the point rail to the wing rail. And if that happened, then it would be possible for the heavy weight of a locomotive or tender to deliver a heavy blow to the wing rail, breaking the already fatigued bolts. The report of the accident concluded that the wheels of a loco or tender which were rigidly held in place would probably have the potential to cross through this sort of damage, but that a bogey? Well, that would oscillate and continue to strike the opposing rails with increasing force, and that would widen the gauge of the rails progressively, up until such a point that the oscillation would become so severe that one wheel would rebound with enough force that the opposite would be forced up and over the rail. Although the steep cant gradient and the sharp curvature could, in the inspectorate's opinion, have given rise to dangerous conditions at the estimated speed of 25 mile an hour, they couldn't reconcile the damage to the crossing with an initial derailment to the left, because they couldn't see how the force required to break the crossing could have been applied by bogies as they were derailed in the other direction. The forces released when a train leaves the rails, however, are very high and the behaviour of bogies is pretty unpredictable, 
Investigators did write, however, that after the trailing wheels of the third coach had been derailed to the left, one or the other of the following bogies was twisted to such an extent that it burst open the right-hand crossing, which allowed for right-hand wheels to drop down and force the left-hand wheels over the opposite rail. Which all sounds a bit wordy and can be quite difficult to keep track of, and I think I probably had to read through it a few times to understand. But all this wound up to the fact that their theory was that the evidence pointed more strongly to the failure of the right-hand wing rail having been the cause and not the effect of the derailment. And the other witness markings and what they found in the wreckage supported this. And because of that fact, the record will forever show that the disaster was initiated by the bursting of the crossing. The speed of the train was considerably higher than the maximum permitted, but in normal circumstances, no horrifically serious consequences would probably be expected from a derailment at 25 mile an hour and only incorporating one train. The unfortunate placement of the Barby Bridge abutment was the factor which turned this into a tragedy. And so our smoking gun was finally located. The report appraised the ministers of how those responsible for the crossing were not paying sufficient attention to the maintenance of it, particularly as they were pumping sleepers and a worn out packing piece, and some missing bolts in the crossing and another loose bolt opposite to it. And While they were aware of the 10 mile an hour restriction, it is clear that they did not appreciate the standard of maintenance which was required for the heavy passenger traffic in this part of the network. The point was raised that some of the failed components, the bolts specifically, well they could develop cracks that weren't visible from an external inspection. The solution to this was to work towards scientifically identifying the behaviour of crossing bolts in service, and that would ascertain whether they should be renewed periodically, depending on the character and weight of them, or whether given good maintenance in other respects, they could probably safely be left in position until the crossing was due for renewal. This is really the start of a concept of asset lives, empirically proven lengths of time that something can remain in place for before it gets too worn out or too risky and needs to have a scheduled replacement. And so many components on the railway are done in this way now. They have an asset life of either a physical length of time or miles travelled depending on if it's track or, or train obviously although the investigation had laid the blame for the accident at a poorly maintained crossing bursting it didn't deny that other factors had contributed speed for example we've touched on it yes Wadsworth had been speeding over the crossover and had the accident taken place at 10 mile an hour it may not have been so severe but this is entering the uh, the world of ifs and buts, and let's be fair, it didn't happen that way, so nobody really knows. The accident may have continued on in much the same way, but slower. Maybe the crossover wouldn't have burst at all, but considering its condition, this was probably a case of when and not if. If it hadn't been the 1006 Express, perhaps it would have been the 1152. Maybe it would have been a train the next day or the day after. It was probably going to go at some point. Not much blame was laid at the feet of the driver though for this speeding. And as I said earlier on, he was at fault for failing to comply with the restriction, but his engine was not fitted with a speed indicator and speeds of 20 to 25 mile an hour might seem deceptively slow on the footplate of a large express engine, especially one that's in good condition as was in this instance. I'd like to look at it this way. We are all really good estimates of driving along at 30 or 70 mile an hour in our cars because, let's be fair, we spend a massive part of our time in the car driving at 30 mile an hour in residential areas, 70 mile an hour on a motorway. 
we're used to doing that. We know what that feels like. We have a good inherent perception of it. I would challenge you to estimate a drive along your road at 10 mile an hour exactly. And I think that's harder to do without looking at speedo because we don't travel at that speed quite so often. Then if you were to take that, that trying to work it out, if you take that, transport yourself a few feet up in the air, put yourself in an environment where you're having to concentrate on loads of other dials and gauges and gizmos and I think you get the image. There was an institutional issue with the speeding as well. After the accident, the engineering department conducted some assessments of trains passing onto the main by this route. And what they found was that routinely that was not adhered to. The vast majority of the trains that passed over that crossover, even so shortly after the accident, were travelling around about 20 miles an hour. It transpired during the course of the investigation that this was a known practice. It was happening all the time and nobody had ever made any effort to bring the practice to an end. They also found that there was an adverse effect to an attempt to operate safely. And sometimes we design in flaws by trying to be safe. It's an, it's an unhappy coincidence, but it does happen. The route from platform four to the crossover was all 10 miles an hour. This limitation was probably perceived to avoid a train getting up to a speed and having to slow down for the crossover. So Wadsworth pulling his train out should never have got above 10, should have crept along to the crossover up onto the main and then opened the throttles. But what this actually did was reduce focus on the actual need for the speed restriction, which was the crossover. So drivers would pull out the station and they wouldn't immediately have their eyes drawn to the crossover and the speed restriction that was in place for that. After the accident, a speed restriction board was erected far closer to the crossing and that was in place to remind drivers this is the reason why you've got your speed restricted. Steep cant gradients are unavoidable in some places, but the report recommended that they should, wherever possible, be eliminated, because they do bring their own risks. The investigators suggested that any layouts with a similar feature should be investigated to say whether they could actually be remodelled at a later date, and the arrangements at Doncaster, understandably, came under this scrutiny. A scheme was prepared in which the scissors was replaced by a simple crossover, one with flatter crossings, an improved cant gradient. Ultimately, this led to speeds of 20 mile an hour being permitted over it and a safer overall transition between the lines. Sometimes when I make these episodes, the recommendations are something that we have to be unpick and uncover from layers and layers of hidden issues and really dive into it and see that's what went wrong and this is what we can do to fix it. And sometimes they're so obvious they might as well be a slap in the face. Today, our last recommendation is a slap. And I'll just read it from the report itself. It is inevitable that there should be a number of places on every railway line where there are very definite limits of safe speed. And for such places, suitable speed limits are prescribed by the engineer. In contrast with accepted practice elsewhere, few locomotives in this country are equipped with speed indicators and reliance is placed on the engine driver to judge his speed with sufficient accuracy in the observance of these prescribed restrictions. There is no question that speed indicators would enable drivers to obey restrictions more accurately than they can do at present, and we have no doubt that they would be welcomed apart from the civil engineers and the footplate staff alike. We therefore recommend that they should form part of the equipment of the new standard locomotives, and that in due time, all engines likely to be used on important passenger services should be similarly equipped. Yes, the final recommendation of the Doncaster report was to install speedometers on trains, which had to obey speed limits at certain points. To me, it, it feels akin to recommending the person boiling his kettle that he needs to put water in it or to the person cooking his tea that the oven might need turning on. The technology existed, 
the industry had simply not embraced it on a widespread basis. As technologically advanced as the UK rail industry has always been, this seems like a glaring gap in the system. It's, it's difficult to reconcile with everything we've learnt in these episodes. But at least at this point, the process began to rectify the issue. Trains need speedometers. Who would have thought it? Photographs of a passenger carriage wrapped around a bridge abutment is without a doubt one of the most striking images that I have seen while I've been producing this podcast. And it is difficult to imagine the feelings, the fear, the horror that people sat within that carriage experienced as it approached the bridge. Less than a minute after leaving the station, some of those on board will probably still have been settling into their seats, preparing for the journey south. A day can change so completely in less than 60 seconds. Maybe it's something we should all consider next time we start our journeys. Maybe we should spare a thought for those who never reach their destination. Thank you as ever for tuning into episode 20. Once again, please like, share, and review. Come interact with me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, just search for Signals to Danger or Daniel Fox Rail. If you do want to support the podcast, there's absolutely no pressure to do it. It's never going to be pay to play, it's always going to be free to access. But if you want to help support me making it, get yourself over to signals to danger.com and either look at the support or the shop pages. You know the next bit. Until the next episode. Travel safe.